at, at rootsaction.org, we've done uh, work with other groups with a, a coalition called Defuse Nuclear War. And as the United States continues to ship huge quantities of weapons into Ukraine, while refusing to engage in uh, substantive diplomacy, the specter of the ultimate war, nuclear war, the ultimate invisible war, nuclear war, is closer than ever. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the panel. Uh, I do want to say that activism is really key to safeguarding the future. I think uh, so many people who are joined with us tonight in watching the film and this panel know that full well. But it's something that we always need to keep reminding ourselves because history, if we simply consume it as a spectacle, is going to take us in the kind of deadly directions that this film outlines. So we have an opportunity to uh, upend the militaristic apple cart to say that it's unacceptable for us to simply watch uh, these wars unfold and see the specter of the future uh, become uh, more and more ominous and dangerous. Well, one last thing I wanna mention is that it becomes really clear, I think, as we think about, for instance, these last few days uh, in the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, that just as the news media distorted in the lead up to the invasion and during and after it, the realities, the human realities, the political ones, the uh, real impacts of war, uh, truth and lies and all the rest of it, uh, those deceptions have continued all the way through. And there's no automatic transmission of information, perspective analysis or anything else from one year to the next or one generation from the next, we all have a responsibility to refuse to accept what is called by journalists, the first draft of history, or even their last or latest draft of history. Because as the film goes into, for so many reasons, those drafts are deceptive with deadly results. We need to be not only rendering and recounting and informing people of accurate history, but change the future. As the saying goes, if we don't like the news, we need to create our own. Thank you so much, Norman. Um, and we already have lots of questions in the chat, so let's get moving. Our next speaker, Kathy Kelly, is a peace activist who, with the Iraq peace team, lived in Iraq during the shock and awe attack and invasion. With Voices in the Wilderness Companions, she helped organize 70 delegations to deliver medical relief supplies from 96 to 2003, openly violating the sanctions and steadily developing friendships with families in Baghdad, Basra, and other Iraqi cities. Since 2021, she and an ad hoc circle of internationals have been assisting young Afghans to resettle in safer havens. She co-coordinates the Band Killer Drones campaign, is board president of World Beyond War, and is planning the 2023 Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. Kathy, Kelly, take it over. Well, thank you, Ryan. And I, I certainly join Norman in looking forward to hearing from each of the panelists and also questions and answers. And Norm, thank you so much for all of the inspiration that your film offers. And of course, you know, part of what it inspires that I think is so necessary for us is the recognition that it's false to glamorize militarism. There's nothing glamorous when you see the shots that show how badly affected people have been by militarism, including many of the militarists themselves. And um, I'm part of World Beyond War, happily so, and, and we're not um, willing to say that any war is a good war. And I actually think right now it's very important to say that when we look at President Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, there are profound similarities between that and what the United States did in its invasions, multiple invasions of Iraq, the wreckage and the destruction and the cruelty. I'm somebody who um, had been told by National Public Radio, um, we will never give you and your group a platform. This was during the time when we were organizing as 
Brian said, 70 delegations that went to Iraq. And we weren't trying to get a platform for ourselves. We just wanted NPR to take a look at what was happening inside of Iraqi hospitals over the tortuous 13 years of economic warfare, of economic sanctions. And so finally, we were pretty excited because NPR sent over some journalists and they were willing to talk with us. And so we met them at a restaurant and they said, well, what do you recommend we do? And we said, well, go to the hospitals. And there was dead silence. And they said, we will never become dupes of Saddam Hussein by going into one of those hospitals. Well, if they'd gone inside the hospitals, they would have seen row upon row, Norman is shaking his head, of children suffering desperately. It, it was like a death row for infants. None of them would be released from the hospitals. And so they said they wouldn't be duped. But then isn't that kind of ironic? Because weren't they duped into thinking that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And it was so unnecessary because there were truthful reports that were available. But the other thing I think about Iraq that's so important for us to reckon with is the question, well, how did people in their millions around the world find out about truthful perspectives regarding Iraq, truthful enough that they were inspired to demonstrate um, all around the world demanding that the war not go forward. How did they, you know how they found out? It was through the grassroots. It was through exactly what inspires roots action. And I might add world beyond war. Small groups of people, ordinary people, veterans for peace, peace action, voices in the wilderness, Pax Christi International. Um, uh, uh, there's so many groups, forgive me, Christian peacemaker teams if I'm overlooking any, but these people went over, saw for themselves, they might have been considered embedded peace journalists. They came back and they said, this is what we've seen and heard. And so that is so, so very, very important to continue passing that on from one generation to the next. And then upholding Barbara Lee, who did speak the truth. Um, right now, I'm part of an effort that we call the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. You know, it's such a um, sort of pileup of uh, an arsenal, really, to maintain this vice-like grip on the American public's education. Because the merchants of death, the ones who go all the way to the banks with their portfolios stuffed and making enormous profits in their profit-making um, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, General Atomics, they can then hire legions of lobbyists, but they also can start to own the corporate media more and more. And so what we're up against is, a, it's almost like a vice-like grip on the education of the U.S. public. But never forget, education, education, education. We must educate ourselves about the realities of militarism and never accept that it's glamorous. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy Kelly. Now, David Swanson is co-founder, executive director, and board member of World Beyond War. And he is campaign coordinator for RootsAction.org. David is an author, activist, journalist, and radio host. David Swanson's books include War is a Lie. He blogs at DavidSwanson.org and WarIsACrime.org. He hosts Talk World Radio. He is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize by the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation. David Swanson. Uh, thank you, Roxanne. Let me see if I can get through uh, six lessons from the destruction of Iraq. One, a war based on lies is simply a very long-winded way of saying a war. There is no such thing as a war not based on lies. What distinguished Iraq 2003 was the ineptness of the lying. We are going to find vast stockpiles of weapons is a really, really stupid lie to tell about a place where you are very shortly going to fail to find any such thing. And yes, they knew that was the case. And so did we. In contrast, 
Russia is going to invade Ukraine tomorrow is a really smart lie to tell if Russia is about to invade Ukraine sometime in the next week, because nobody's going to care that you got the day wrong. And statistically, practically nobody is going to have the resources to understand that what you've really said is now that we've broken promises, torn up treaties, militarized the region, threatened Russia, lied about Russia, facilitated a coup, opposed a peaceful resolution, supported attacks on Donbass, escalated those attacks in recent days while mocking utterly reasonable peace proposals from Russia, we can count on Russia invading, just as we've strategized to make happen, including in published RAND reports. And when that happens, we are going to load the whole zone up with more weapons than we ever pretended Saddam Hussein had, and we're going to block any peace negotiations negotiations in order to keep the war going as hundreds of thousands die, which we don't think you'll object to, even if it risks nuclear apocalypse, because we've preconditioned you with five years of ludicrous lies about Putin owning Trump. Two, we never made people understand that the lies were not only typical of all wars, but also, as with all wars, irrelevant and off topic. Every lie about Iraq could have been perfectly true and there would have been no case for attacking Iraq. The U.S. openly acknowledged having every weapon it pretended Iraq had without creating any case for attacking the United States. Having weapons is not an excuse for a war. It makes no difference whether it's true or false. The same can be said of economic policies of China or anyone else. This week, I watched a video of a former prime minister of Australia ridiculing a bunch of journalists for not being able to distinguish China's trade policies from an imaginary and ludicrous fantasy of a Chinese threat to invade Australia. But is there a member of the U.S. Congress who can make that distinction or a follower of either U.S. political party who will be able to much longer? The war in Ukraine has been named by the U.S. government slash media the unprovoked war, quite obviously, precisely because it was so clearly provoked. But this is the wrong question. You don't get to wage a war if it was provoked, and you don't get to wage a war if the other side was unprovoked. I mean, not legally, not morally, not as part of a strategy for preserving life on Earth. Number three, we never did even really try to teach the public that the wars are one-sided slaughters. U.S. polling for years found majorities believing the sick and ridiculous ideas that U.S. casualties were somewhere near equivalent to Iraqi casualties and that the U.S. had suffered more than Iraq, as well as that Iraqis were grateful or that Iraqis were inexcusably ungrateful. The fact that well over 90 percent of the deaths were Iraqis never got through, nor the fact that they were disproportionately the very old and young nor even the fact that wars are fought in people's towns and not on 19th century battlefields. The U.S. peace movement chose to focus on the damage the war was doing to U.S. troops and the financial cost to taxpayers and not to make ending a one-sided slaughter a moral question. Number four, we still talk about the media as having been an accomplice to the Bush-Cheney gang. I think it's time we recognize how much the media outlets wanted the war on Iraq for their own profit and ideological reasons, and that the media has played the leading role in building up hostility with Russia and China, Iran and North Korea. If anyone is playing supporting actor in this drama, it is government officials. At some point, we will have to learn to appreciate whistleblowers and independent reporters and to recognize that corporate media as a mass is the problem, not just one part of the corporate media. Number five, we did not follow through. The architects of the murder of a million people went golfing and got rehabilitated by the very same media criminals who had pushed their lies. Looking forward replaced the rule of law. Open profiteering, murder, and torture became policy choices, not crimes. Impeachment was stripped from the U.S. Constitution for any bipartisan offenses. There was no truth and reconciliation process. Now the U.S. works to prevent the reporting of even Russian crimes to the International Criminal Court because preventing any sort of rules is the top priority of the rules-based order. 
presidents have been given all war powers and darn near everybody has failed to grasp that the monstrous powers given to that office are drastically more important than which flavor of monster occupies the office. Repealing a couple of the least used AUMFs worries exactly no weapons maker on earth. A bipartisan consensus opposes ever using the war powers resolution. While Johnson and Nixon had to clear out of town and opposition to war lasted long enough to label it a sickness, the Vietnam syndrome. In this case, the Iraq syndrome lasted long enough to keep Kerry and Clinton out of the White House, but not Biden. And nobody has drawn the lesson that these syndromes are fits of wellness, not of illness. And number six, we failed in not saying one word about the evil of the Iraqi side of the war on Iraq. Iraqis might have been better off exclusively using organized nonviolent activism, but saying so was not acceptable. So we generally treated one side of the war as bad and the other as good, exactly as the Pentagon did, only with the sides switched. This was not good preparation for a war in Ukraine, where not only is the other side, the Russian side, clearly engaged in reprehensible horrors, but those horrors are the primary topic of corporate media. With people's brains conditioned to believe that one side or the other must be holy and good, many in the West pick the US side. Opposing both sides of the war in Ukraine and demanding peace is denounced by each side as somehow constituting support for the other side. Because the concept of more than one party being flawed has been erased from the collective brain. We need to shift to understanding the enemy to be war itself, because right now, enemy number one, China, is generating hatred for threatening what Washington wants least, namely peace. When we reach the point of needing a war on China as punishment for advancing peace in the world and peace rallies in the United States still have U.S. flags at them, you will know that we are going to perish, leaving some lessons yet to be learned. Thank you so much, David. Uh, that was concise and uh, very nice. Next, we have India Walton. India Walton is a senior strategic organizer for Roots Action Education Fund. She is the former Western New York senior advisor at the New York Working Families Party. She is a registered nurse, and she famously stunned the incumbent mayor in the Democratic Party primary for the 2021 election for mayor of Buffalo, New York. India. Um, good evening, everyone. This was a really good film. It was my first time seeing it. Um, great, great job, Norman, and to, to all who were involved. Um, also, it's very difficult to follow after David. I'm still thinking about many of the things you said. Um, you know, but when I think about foreign policy, because I'm an average working class everyday Jane, I try and think about how it applies to my everyday life, how I would explain this to my children, my neighbors, you know, folks in the coffee shop. And the normalization of war. Um, I can't remember a time that we weren't at war in some form or fashion. The glorification of violence against people from other nations and other cultures is something that not only have we internalized individually, but we see it play out on a systemic level. When we look at the militarization of police, when we look at the othering of longtime residents of communities and neighborhoods, as we see those neighborhoods change, I'm thinking about the lack of humanity in the media coverage, you know, a million people died, 8 million people being displaced. And there has not been any reckoning in the collective American conscious about undoing those harms and about making sure that we don't continue to repeat these mistakes. Meanwhile, we have a, de a defense budget that at the federal level continues to be bloated and increases while social safety nets languish. Um, and communities are living in austerity and folks are unhoused and strapped under debt and struggling with inflation. 
And we continue to fund efforts to destabilize governments. Um, and I, I think that what I appreciate the most is that in this space, we've not used the, war, the, the words war in Iraq because essentially it was not. It was an invasion. Our country invaded Iraq, destabilized it, and then washed our hands and, and, and left um, with no humanitarian aid to help the millions of people who were negatively impacted, the millions of families who lost homes, lost lives, children who are now orphaned. Um, you know, I, now it's 20 years later, but I mean, these, we know that the effects of war last, are long lasting and, and will last for generations. So this has been a really eye-opening experience for me. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to digging deeper into it. I think at, at the time of the invasion of Iraq, I might have um, been in my early 20s and may, maybe not have been as aware as I am now. So I'm, I'm looking forward to really digging in and looking back on that and taking some lessons um, out of it. So thank you. Thank you, India Walton. Marcy Winograd is a longtime anti-war activist. She is the coordinator of Code Pink Congress and also serves as co-chair of the Peace in Ukraine Coalition, also co-chair of the End Wars and Occupations team for Progressive Democrats of America. In 2020, Marcy served as a DNC delegate to Bernie Sanders. Marcy also co-founded the Progressive Caucus of the California Democratic Party. Marcy marched against the Vietnam War in high school and later joined the defense team of Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg. Marcy Winograd. I'm seeing Marcy and I don't see that she's muted but we'll give it another moment. Uh, I know that we have Dennis Kucinich joining us as well. We may take them in opposite order. Yeah, let's go ahead. And Dennis, if you're ready, we can go to you. Um, Dennis Kucinich is former US Congressman and two-time presidential candidate from Ohio. He served 16 years in the US House of Representatives and led the congressional opposition to the Iraq war. Uh, Representative Kucinich, do we have you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. And uh, the machine here says, if you'll uh, permit me to get into video, I'll do that. All right, Bill, if you could flip that if you could, or. There you are. Hello, hello. <laughs> so um, thanks to uh, Norm Solomon and all the organizations involved for bringing us together. Uh, Norm, uh, just so you know, you know, prominent in my little library here is this uh, book that you wrote in 2005, which is the basis of the uh, documentary that everyone just looked, you know, had a chance to witness. And of course, uh, Norm and I have worked together for years on, on these matters. Um, it's, it's tough for me to go over this territory and I'll tell you why. Because uh, I, you know, I served in Congress for 16 years and in 12 of those years were periods where uh, it was the run up to the Iraq war, the, the Iraq war and then um, it's uh, gradual cessation. During that time, I went to the floor of the House uh, 341 times to get presentations, speeches, propose ways to stop the war, to create peace. Uh, and I, I, you know, I just poured my heart out into this. On October the um, 2nd, 2002, I distributed, uh, I began distribution of a memo 
to over 250 members of Congress personally. I went to the floor of the House and put a memo in their hand. And what, and what was that memo about? It was a memo that was refuting the Bush administration's resolution calling uh, for an attack on Iran. And what, what it did essentially is this. It said, look, there is absolutely no proof that Iraq had anything to do with 9-11, despite the fact that the Bush administration repeatedly tried to conflate Iraq with 9-11. I, I said there is, uh, Iraq had, had not only had nothing to do with 9-11, they didn't have anything to do with Al-Qaeda's role in 9-11. Uh, Iraq uh, didn't have the intention of attacking the United States. They did not have the capability of attacking the United States. Their military budget was uh, about 1%, certainly a fraction of whatever the United States at that time was spending on preparing for war. And uh, that Iraq did not have the um, fabled weapons of mass destruction. Uh, even more than that, there, there was um, never a confirmation by any of the intelligence agencies of anything that the Bush administration was saying uh, in, in a run to war, to confirm it, to say, yes, we, we have a problem here, uh, there's danger. None of that existed. How could that have come to be? Well, it, it, you know, despite the fact that this information was put right in front of members of Congress, I put it in their hands and said, look, please read this before your vote. The vote came about seven days later. The war resolution passed. Now, 60% uh, of Democrats voted against it. And that was a result of not only my work, but others uh, who I helped organize, and we made a strong case. Uh, but of course, uh, the Republicans following Bush's lead, all except six of them, including Ron Paul, uh, approved, the, approved the war. It's not just that that Congress was lied to, the American people is lied to. Now, I, I was glad to see uh, Dave Swanson uh, on this, uh, on this uh, uh, call because uh, Dave is certainly gonna remember uh, the month of June, 2008, where he joined with me in, in my office to craft dozens of resolutions uh, of impeachment, dozens of articles of impeachment, which, uh, uh, which, you know, we, we started with about 65 or 66. We whittled it down to about four dozen. And, and it's, worth, it's worth just mentioning someone right now in the context of, of uh, the documentary and also in the context of, of, uh, of Iraq. But as we're looking forward into what's, you know, what are the conflicts that await us, uh, the first article, was that Bush created a secret propaganda campaign to manufacture a false case for war against Iraq. They put together a classic uh, Madison Avenue advertising effort inside the White House and then outside the White House that internal and external means to do it, to sell the war. And that involved major appearances on networks by the president, the vice president, the Secretary of, uh, of State, Secretary of Defense, uh, and famously uh, later on Colin Powell at, at the UN. And of course, you know, what, what are the American people to believe when they hear everywhere they turn and hear it on the media it says, hey, um, uh, you know, Iraq's gonna attack us, we better get them first. The second article was falsely, systematically, and with criminal intent, conflating the attacks of September 11, 2001, uh, with misrepresentation of Iraq as an immense security threat. Now, I remember on the second anniversary of 9-11, Bush went to uh, New York City at the site of the, um, of, of, of the attacks, and he basically put Iraq in the same, you know, in the same speech as he did a condemnation of the 9-11 attacks. And this was consciously done in order to help uh, make a case for an attack on, on Iraq. And again, uh, how, how were the American people to know anything unless uh, you know, when they put their confidence in their leaders 
as to uh, as to what uh, what the country ought to do after 9-11. But what Bush and his group did is they made a conscious decision to go after Iraq. And that decision was probably made years earlier. It was certainly made before 9-11. And so, you know, how much time do we have right now? Because I see, uh, uh, you know, it looks like a moderator is coming up again. Do I have a few more minutes? Uh, if you could, yeah, wrap up, give us another minute or two. That's fine. Well, the, the point being that that anyone who goes over, uh, who reviews uh, the articles of impeachment, those articles are a compendium of the assaults against uh, not just democracy, but against humanity that occurred. And we're at a point right now in human history where we have to make a decision whether or not we're going to challenge the, the very basis that this country is operating on, which is a basis of imperialism to, to keep on moving ahead and grabbing territory, nations, resources, and whatever in order to keep expanding this uh, hold on the world, which frankly has become more and more tenuous. And uh, the next war we get into uh, will, will probably be the last war uh, America uh, gets into. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this. And just uh, uh, just a final note here. This is a, a copy of a uh, of a very worn piece of paper that I carried in my wallet for many years, which shows uh, Congress after Congress, uh, where how many speeches I gave on the floor of the House, not only to uh, uh, against the war in in Iraq, but to try to uh, stop the, any kind of an attack on on Iran. 155 uh, presentation. You know, wherever we're at, whatever we have, we put it all on the line, and I did in Congress. Thank you, Dennis Kucinich. And now we have Marcy Winograd, who has conquered <laughs> technology to join us. Thank you. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Roxanne. What a pleasure. It is to be here with Dennis Kucinich, with uh, India, with David Swanson, with Kathy Kelly. Uh, I'm really, really honored to be with you. And you know, watching Norman's film, War Made Easy, really um, made me think very deeply about the media, about uh, corporate media and, and what we're up against. And I think it was uh, one of the speakers who said it's, it's like a vise. You know, and uh, but I do feel really inspired uh, coming up, coming off of this uh, March 18th day of action. I don't know how many of you uh, were following this, but there were thousands of people who converged on Washington, D.C. to march on the White House to say, uh, fund the people's needs, not the war machine. And in Los Angeles, where I was, we were protesting. Hundreds of us converged on CNN uh, in a highly trafficked location in Hollywood to say, stop the stenography for the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. I think Norman's point about the fourth estate surrendering its responsibility, uh, trading access and uh, what have you for truth is, is so important to keep in mind. And so I would echo the call to focus on the media and their role, their complicity in endless war. I, I think it was mentioned that I serve as co-chair of the Peace in Ukraine Coalition. I want to invite everybody to join us. We represent over 100 organizations, including World Beyond War, <clears throat> excuse me, Roots Action. Uh, this was uh, launched by Code Pink in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, 2022. We know the war did not start then, but nonetheless, this is uh, what we are funding to the tune of $115 billion today, 50 billion of which is for weapons and military training. Uh, as a coordinator of Code Pink Congress, bi-monthly calls on demilitarization and foreign policy, Medea, I work closely with Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink, Jody Evans, also co-founder of Code Pink, to look at diplomatic solutions to the war in Ukraine. I think that's what we need to present to people. I, I think people, I don't understand what it looks like to have an alternative to war, what massive nonviolent cooperation 
or, or refusal to cooperate would look like and how that is another option. And I would, I would urge us all to elevate that and to share that with people because they don't understand it. Um, at the protest in, at CNN in Hollywood, people were, we had a lot of young people, you know, the Answer Coalition was instrumental in organizing this as was the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Uh, lots of young people of uh, diverse ethnicities came out. This was an embrace of a lot of other struggles, including the struggles of Palestinians. Uh, and I think because of that, we, we brought out a very diverse and inspired crowd. And I think right now, you know, we're in a really tough spot. Of course, the left is somewhat divided on this, uh, but we still need to appeal to everyday working people. You know, when I was uh, petitioning people in my hometown of Santa Barbara, California, to say to my congressman, we want to seize, we want you to support a ceasefire. The people who were most responsive were the employees at the local market. They get it. They got it. And I think that as much as we can, we need to reach out to labor because why didn't we stop the invasion and occupation of Iraq? I think one reason is because uh, even though we were almost a global superpower in our marches to end the war, we could not soon enough withhold the support of labor. We could not shut, shut down the port of Los Angeles. The ILW shut down the port of San Francisco in 2008. At that point, many lives had already been lost. So my, my message is this, focus on the media. We need a lot more pressure on the media. We need to go after these advertisers. Liberty Mutual is a huge advertiser on cable television uh, and say, we, we don't like what we're seeing. This is uh, stenography for the Pentagon and endless war. We're risking nuclear war. We've got to uh, organize labor, reach out to labor. And we have to focus on education, as was mentioned earlier by reaching out to high schools and colleges. And all of this is a lot of work. It's heavy lifting, but that's what we're here for, right? Uh, at this moment, at this juncture, domestically, the focus is on education. Because you know what? The right wing knows that's where it's at. That's who's coming up. That's why they want to purge the curriculum of any uh, discussion of slavery, of genocide of Native, Native Americans. The APAC, they send organizers onto our college campuses. So let's keep that in mind, the media, education, and labor. Thank you very much. And thank you, Marcy Winograd. Thank you all for your informed passions and your seasoned views. You've likely already answered many of the questions that the um, attendees may have, but um, I'm gonna kick off the Q&A period by addressing how democracy is undermined by the erosion of the values that our members of the press claim to uphold as practitioners in the fourth estate. I believe, and, and I agree with Bob McChesney on this, that, the, that democracy should provide for a system of political communication that informs and engages the citizenry. So such insidious control of the media as Norman has exposed in War Made Easy encourages a weak political culture, a disaffected public, apathetic and self-centered, and so the kinds of actions that Marcy Winograd just described begins to answer this, but I would ask Norman first and, and then any of the panelists who care to follow up, but also bearing in mind that we have lots of questions in the queue. How do you get people exercised about things we believe should be making them outraged? Norman? There are so many connections and so many different uh, pathways to that. So of course, many rather than just one or two, but I would say that what Martin Luther King talked about is so often, of course, uh, suppressed uh, by the US corporate media. He referred to the funding and the war effort as a whole uh, in Vietnam as a, quote, demonic suction tube, unquote. And you travel, if you do anywhere of substance around the United States, you see the decimation of our, com our communities, healthcare, education, housing, infrastructure, this country is through the neoliberal model and corporate greed and militarism and imbalance of taxation that lets the wealthy and corporations off uh, pretty lightly. This is a destructive momentum in our country. So long story short, as we uh, educate, agitate, and challenge propaganda about militarism as it is a heavy impact overseas, 
those connections that King talked about are absolutely crucial here at home because the, as he put it, uh, the bombs in Vietnam exploded home metaphorically. And we have a lot of explosions now destroying lives in the United States because of US militarism. Thank you so much, Norman. We've gotten 60 some questions submitted. So I'm gonna get through as many of them as I can. Uh, for the panelists, if you could keep answers 30 seconds, try to be as tight as you can, you won't always be able to. Uh, and I'm just gonna put these questions out there. Feel free to just pop in and start answering. Um, a lot of questions about, what well, does the media want war? What's the real reason the media wants war? Or does the media just want money? Um, and, and another side of that coin is, what's the real reason the United States wants war? Power, oil, money, imperialism, empire. So for anybody, the real reasons the media wants war, the real reason the US wants war. Does anyone wanna try to answer those? Well, I'll offer a thought. Yeah, Marcy and then David. <laughs> okay. I think the media in, in large part, uh, besides the fact that they are now more and more colluding with think tanks that are promoting war and actually conducting mock war games between the United States and China, uh, the media also likes conflict. I mean, they know that people are interested in conflict. That's, that's sort of the heart of storytelling. So rather than the conflict be war, uh, why don't we say the conflict must be our debate over war as an institution and promote debate on it, on the media, in the media. Thank you. Uh, David, go ahead and then Kathy. You know, I had really, really smart, informed people tell me that the war on Iraq was different from every other war because uh, there were these lies involved. Uh, and so I went and wrote a book called War is a Lie, trying to see if I could find a war in the history of the planet that wasn't based on lies. And, and of course, I couldn't. It, it, I couldn't find a war that was purely defensive or humanitarian or spreading democracy or human rights or, or any of it didn't exist anywhere. Couldn't find it. So then I had to ask, well, what are the wars for? Right. And you can find all kinds of reasons and no single one that covers all wars, of course, much as everyone wants one, uh, including profits, including electoral concerns, including uh all variety of corruption and the and the inertia of a system that's structured so that you advance if you support war. Uh, but I still couldn't explain it without without sheer mad, insane power lust. I couldn't explain the wars without uh, without a, a sort of a general group think of insane, sadistic cruelty. There wasn't an explanation that uh, that could quite explain uh, most of these wars. So there, there are lots of explanations and lots of factors that we can go after and eliminate, and it lessens the push for war. Uh, but unless you look at the at the sheer insanity of of New York Times columnists who want to bust down doors and tell somebody to suck on something, you you, you can't explain it all. Kathy. I was going to ask India if she could comment further on the connection between racism and war. I remember Phil Berrigan said racism is like a many-faced hydra, you know, and you know, you chop off one face and another one grows up, but you can aim it anywhere around the world if there's a racist belief that some people aren't equal to others. Could you say more of what your experience has been, India? Yeah, um, thank you, Kathy. I think that is exactly right. Um, I think the dehumanizing and othering of populations of people allow us to be very comfortable with tragedy when it's when it's happening to someone else, right? And I think that even when we look at the conflict in Ukraine, we're seeing white presenting Ukrainians be welcomed with open arms as they escape the tragedies that are occurring. And then we see students of African descent not being able to cross borders and seek sanctuary in other countries, right? Um, and I think that, you know, like we've talked about the ramifications that it has here domestically, 
when we see the militarization of the police force, right? A lot of those tools are being used against people of color. And that violence manifests not only in policing, but in housing, right? When we look at the eviction crisis, the people who are most likely to be pushed out of their homes, you know, I, I want to say that the shortest answer to this question about why war is the enclosure of power and wealth. It is keeping some people powerful and many people wealthy and poor and disenfranchised people poor and disenfranchised. And a lot of times those are folks who are people of color, people from other nations. And we have to find a way to talk about anti-war and anti-violence as a racial justice issue because it is. Thank you, India. Uh, moving to a really in the weeds question, I guess, well, I guess the first part of it is not in the weeds. How much was Iraq about oil? But the second part, does the U.S. control Iraqi oil interests today? Or what is our, what is U.S. relationship with Iraqi oil today? Um, but first, how much was the Iraq war just purely about oil? I think it's maybe more helpful to say it was about the control of the pricing and flow of oil. And I think that the United States also wanted to say to every other country around the world, if you don't subordinate yourselves to our perceived national interest in terms of controlling resources, we'll eliminate you. And if you don't believe that, please witness Iraq. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, lots of questions here. Here's one specifically um, uh, for uh, Representative Kucinich. Uh, Dennis, when you said the next war will be the last, should we assume this means uh, nuclear? You you would imagine that a nuclear war is on the horizon? It's a, uh, it's a big risk right now. And the reason is because we didn't learn anything from Vietnam. We didn't learn anything from Iraq. We have the same people who... Uh, either they personally or their uh, hirelings are involved in promoting conflict uh, with Russia and uh, with China. Uh, there's a point at which the world community is already prepared to separate itself from the United States uh, economically. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing the meeting that took place between uh, President Putin and uh, President Z uh, today is a is a is a good example of a powerful ally, a powerful alliances being formed. Uh, more often than not, because of a mutual concern about the aggressiveness of the United States of America, Beijing doesn't want to be the next uh, uh, doesn't want Taiwan to be the next Ukraine, and will not permit it. So uh, my concern is we could stumble into a nuclear exchange. And with uh, Russia actually having more nuclear weapons than us, uh, and the United States uh, not, not really interested in diplomacy because we keep pushing, 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 you know, we could, we could easily find ourselves in, in a nuclear war. And that's why our collective action here is very important because the... Uh, <clears throat> The dim-wittedness that took us into Iraq that uh, that has, with NATO, uh, forced a uh, uh, a conflict with with Russia over Ukraine, uh, that has sent our leaders into um, Taiwan to beard the dragon across the straits. Hey, you know we're talking about people who don't seem to have any common sense at all. They want to rattle the sabers. They want to increase the military budget. They want to create this specter. They're creating hysteria right now in Australia. It's extraordinary what's happening in Australia, where they've got the whole people of Australia on edge because the media is putting these big headlines out about uh, China's getting ready to attack and try to take over Australia, but the United States will defend it. I mean, this, this kind of crap that passes for diplomacy and statecraft and information so yeah, are we at risk? Uh, yeah, but uh, can we uh, stop it through 
uh, our collective organized efforts, yeah, I think we can push back and each one of us can make a difference. But we cannot underestimate the danger of the hour. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, it is nine o'clock now. If anyone has to go, I totally understand, but I think we'll keep this going for another 10 or 15 minutes because we kind of got behind and we still have just tons of questions. Uh, so stick around if you can. We still have 250 people on the call, so uh, lots of interest still. Uh, the next question, uh, let's talk about U.S. propaganda efforts. Um, despite the current access to information from the internet, U.S. propaganda seems to be as effective today or maybe more so than it was during the Iraq war. How is this possible? Has the prop or what we're calling propaganda changed? Has it evolved? What's different? Uh, any comments on that? I, I think part of it, part of it has to do with the fact that uh, President Biden is basically free reign. He's not being challenged from inside the Democratic Party. The, the Democratic Party has been absolutely pathetic. They have merged to become a uniparty with the Republicans on this war. Now, it's, some Republicans are the most conservative bent who are challenging uh, uh, the war and this administration's policies. So, I mean, that's one reason. And if, the, and if you don't have any voices from within the institution challenging things in a, in a major and forthright way, the media just keeps its... Uh, it's, it's information flow. And, and this isn't new, by the way, in, in even recent history. Uh, there was a, a writer by the name of Daniel Borston who wrote a book called Press and the Cold War. And what it is, it's a, it's a study on how during the period of the Cold War, during the 50s and the, and the 60s, the, um, uh, th there was rhetorical exchanges between Russia and uh, Soviet Union and the United States creating a dialectic of conflict. And as a result of that, that helped certain um, constituencies within each country grow, become more wealthy, become more prominent. And so, uh, so you had the, the, the militarist in the US and the militarist in Russia. And you know what happened, the, the height of that, the zenith of it, uh, ended up being the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and, if, uh, uh, and if Kennedy didn't find a way to reach out to Khrushchev, um, maybe we wouldn't be here today to, to have this discussion. But, we're, but what we know right now is the U.S. is not interested in diplomacy. They, they could have ended uh, the conflict. It, it could have prevented the conflict from occurring. They wanted the conflict. They wanted to put Russia on the back foot. They wanted Russia to, uh, to be engaged in this. So then they could pivot to China which is actually the real plan here. War with China. They're planning a war with China in three years. Well, we're dealing with people who are at the levers of power, who actually, you know, who shouldn't be there, but are there because our political system creates the uniparty. And unless it's challenged in 2024, you know, we could, we could probably look forward, uh, not look forward to a, a war with China. Thank you. And, and a quick, quick remind. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, David. Well, I was just going to add, I, I, I think Dennis is right. The biggest factor is the, is the partisan one. There's not a party op opposed to the war. Um, we ought to have bigger peace rallies when we're up against two parties than we're up against, when we're up against only one party. We have the opposite, of course. Um, but I think the propaganda has become more and more skilled, uh, particularly in the area of demonizing, uh, whether it's Putin or Assad or, or whoever it might be. I'm just reading this book that's just coming out soon called Atrocity Fabrication and Its Consequences, uh, they've gotten very, very good at, at accusations and demonization. Uh, and you could, you could speak out for peace and you, you weren't accused of being paid by Saddam Hussein. You weren't a lover of Saddam Hussein. You were just advocating for peace. You can't do that now without uh, being a Putin lover. And, and Putin is Hitler. Uh, if not something, you know, vastly worse than that. So they, they've gotten very when they can when they can get random people concerned about Ukraine in a matter of hours who didn't know where the place was the day before, when they can make the, the Hollywood symbol of evil, the German tank, a moral necessity of the moment in a matter of hours. I mean, this is powerful stuff. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, uh quickly to Dennis's comments on like nuclear war and stuff. Just a reminder that none of us survived nuclear war. 
just a reminder there. We all starve to get to death have, together. Have a nice day. <laughs> yeah, the type of solidarity we don't want is all of us starving uh, to death together. Um, moving on. Um, speaking of diplomacy, uh, what do you think will be the result of the Nord Stream sabotage? The investigations into it, thoughts on that. Um, anybody want to jump into that? I don't want to. I don't want to monopolize this uh, Q and A, but I just want to say I wrote a piece on Substack. Uh, and any of you get a chance to look at Substack.com, you'll see the post that I did on uh, on, on Nord Stream and uh, following up on the work of Seymour Hirsch, which was absolutely heroic. Um, and then I also did one on the Iraq War. It's worth looking at. But with respect to Nord Stream, is there anybody with a degree of common sense? Who thinks the United States didn't blow up that pipeline? I mean, and and everybody who was involved out of Washington, and Hirsch nailed this story. Everyone involved out of Washington committed a war crime, <laughs> and and they also violated the U.S. Constitution by you know leaping over Congress. And uh, where's the investigation going? One country after another, they're trying to sh trying to bury any kind of uh, information. Why? Because the U.S. did it, so no one knows how to deal with it. And, you know, we did it to our ally. 83 million Germans who rely on that for energy, uh, relied on Nord Stream for energy. You know, they had to find another uh, another uh, resource. Where did they get it from? The United States, which marked up the price of energy four to six times. What a coincidence. Yeah, happened to line up with uh, a push for our own liquid natural gas exports. How convenient. Anybody else on Nord Stream? Well, I just want to say that in a way, I think one of Dennis's counterparts in the world is Jeremy Corbyn. And Jeremy Corbyn in the UK emphasizes that we do have this capacity with the internet to develop more and more international solidarity. And I think that this issue is one in which it's possible that many, many more Europeans are going to say, you know what, we've been had. Um, Kathy, so you're 100% right. But what, what if you look at the the BBC, if you look at the German media, they're pretty much in the tank with the with the narrative that maybe Russia blew it up or God knows who blew it up. No one wants to put it on the US because they're all afraid to do that. That's that's part of the problem. Yeah. I, I think you're right, but I still hold out some hope that internationally- As do I, might as, do, as do I. And thanks for bringing that up. Following up on that, um, in the film, Norman said that support for war drops when war is deemed unwinnable and people believe that they were deceived. When it comes to Ukraine, is the war winnable and have people been deceived? Well, I jump in really quick. The glorification of the Walter Cronkite uh, sermon that he gave in, I believe, 68, that it turns out that the war is not winnable as though that's a moral statement. It isn't, it's a tactical statement. And the idea that U.S. wars are only good if they're winnable is, is so morally corrupt and dangerous that we need to look at a completely different calculus to avoid, to avoid and oppose wars. Anybody perhaps, else? Go ahead, yeah, Marcy. Perhaps there's another way of phrasing it, and that is that there is no military solution to this conflict. Uh, and that's why we need diplomacy, not war. When do the quagmire talks start? Speaking of the movie, that's rhetorical. Um, let's uh, go back to Bush and Cheney. Uh, we'll, we'll stay on for about five more minutes. Um, why has there been no legal action against George Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, nothing against the CIA for torture? Nobody got in trouble for any of that. Why is that? Are there mechanisms? Is anybody trying? Is it possible? Well, mostly I, everybody kind of laughed at that. So that's good. I want to notice so that um, some Yemeni Americans are bringing suit against some of the corporations that were responsible for U.S. attacks that killed civilians in Yemen. So, you know, maybe we won't be able to go for the governments, but in Europe, there's a uh, coalition of human rights groups trying to sue Saudi Arabia for human rights abuses because of its um, usage of these different weapons. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, sue the companies 
that supplied the weapons to Saudi Arabia. So um, I think we have to try to affect every branch of government, the executive, the judicial, the legislative, and, and pushing for recognition that war is never the answer. You know, Roots Action put up billboards in Spain and visited Spanish consulates in the U.S. to thank the judge over there for trying to prosecute U.S. officials for torture. Uh, and the pressure from the U.S. was too great and it was dropped and similar efforts were dropped in uh, in Belgium and anyone anywhere else, anyone had the nerve to try it. Um, but that's what it's going to take uh, unless we get a democratized United Nations and a real global international legal system. Uh, the U.S. wants ad hoc special victors justice without victory against Russia. And Russia wants the same against the U.S. Uh, around Nord Stream and so forth. Neither one wants the International Court of Justice or the International Criminal Court to be an actual court applying equally to everyone. They want they want it to stay an international criminal court for Africans. Uh, and so this is that in this broken system, it's going to take somebody with more courage than uh, that judge in Spain. It's it's going to take incredible nerve. You know, D David's uh, D David's right. And um, there there are vehicles out there right now for prosecution exists within the U.S. Constitution because, you know, there's there's numerous provisions of the Constitution which prohibit the kind of action that George Bush, Bush took in the name of the American people against Iraq. And treaties that the U.S. signed are, are also the law of the land for the United States. And numerous treaties were broken in that in the attack on on Iraq. So, I think that you know there there is a possibility in the future that uh, the U.S. could hold uh, somebody like Bush accountable and and the, and that whole group with him. That there will be charges in a world court, uh, notwithstanding that, as Dave said, there's you know questions as to how uh, how uh, impartial they could be. But I think you're going to see cases brought there. And I think uh, gatherings like this remind all of us of our responsibility individually and collectively to move things along in that direction. If there's a loud enough outcry, uh, you know, it, it, it can be ignored only so long. So, uh, you, you know, it's truth crushed to the ground shall rise again. And I think that uh, the effort of, of, of all of us to keep alive this discussion about accountability, which is really what it's about, is critical. I mean, it, it, it really goes to the essence of what does it mean to be human? <laughs> because we have psychopaths that are, that are running uh, national policy right now. They don't have anything to, they seem to lack any compassion, any sense of decency, and they're only interested in power and, and they don't care who they kill. And we, we, we are the response to that. We care. That's right. And it, it may be important to point out to the media if you can or if we can, uh, you know, they're really cheering on those, you know, war crime charges against Putin. All, you know, cool. But where's that energy when it comes to the U.S. and, and George W. Bush? Um, let's get to our let's pray. This might be the last question, but we're going to try to maybe answer some in a follow up email. We will see um, how can people become more media literate? to learn how to question and empower themselves and not have the wool pulled over their eyes by the media. Well, I wanna recommend Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, fair.org. And uh, you can get on their email alert list. It's been analyzing media cover-ups for war crimes and much else in US policy for more than three decades, a really good resource that we should propagate. You know, um... India is working on housing concerns really hard and people who've been evicted. And I think if you go to a neighborhood and you find the people who are rolling up their sleeves and working to get food to people who are hungry or working to get housing for people who have lost their housing, those people will help you figure out the media. So I think that um, the, the poorest in our world ought to be our number one concern and 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 partly that's out of you know just survival so i think that um we can start to kind of it's like toto and the wizard of oz pull down the curtain we can do that 
when we catch courage from one another. But I think trying to go and link up with the people that are bearing the brunt of the worst abuses is, is a good way to start. I also want to just um, plug my love of independent media, um, your local independent newspaper, um, Democracy Now!, The Laura Flanders Show, Progressive Hub. Um, these are all very reliable sources of like the real truth of, of what's happening. Um, so though we might be small, <laughs> um, we, we are mighty. And I think that we need to really seek out and support our independent voices in the media. Absolutely. And I would piggyback on that and say, we're more likely to see our letters to the editor published in local press than in the Washington Post, which refuses to meet with us. David sent them a letter. Uh, so I would encourage everybody, if you haven't already, uh, to submit letters to your local press. I did here in Santa Barbara, California on Chumash land, and uh, it was titled Sleepwalking into World War III. Well, the, the paper published a number of hostile responses very angry responses to my letter. And then in turn, you know, a number of us pushed to have a response, which they published a response from us. Uh, Stop talking about this war as though it's only Ukraine's uh, future at stake. Anyway, the point is local, local, local. Uh, if I could add, uh, add to what's already been said. Uh, each of us, we talk about the media, each of us, is a medium. Each of us has the opportunity to communicate peace in our daily lives, in our contacts with others. Uh, and, and that is, is an activity. It's also a consciousness. Uh, Jung spoke of the collective and articulated consciousness. We hold peace in our hearts. We think peacefully. We give peace to others. Uh, there is there is this uh, unified field which we're creating. And it, it's not about fear of war. We don't want war, but it's about infusing everything that we do with a with a with a pacific sense. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dennis. I said that was the last question. There's one I really want to ask though. Um and five, 10 second answers, maybe just yes or no's, but uh, I think Dennis, you'll want to answer this and several other of you who talk to representatives. Is it ever the case that there are anti-war sentiments in Congress uh, amongst representatives that they are afraid to share? Electeds who want to be anti-war, but fear the politics and backlash of being anti-war. Those people exist? Absolutely, 100%. That's good. And it's, I see lots of head nods, so it seems to be everyone's experience. So that at least leaves me optimistic to know that there are people who are on our side if we can just push them and show that they have the support and they won't face the uh, backlash that they so much fear. So th that's good to, to leave on an optimistic note. Um, real quickly to everyone, we still have 220 people on the call. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, share this movie while it's still available for free. Uh, bit.ly slash war made easy, all lowercase. That's bit.ly slash war made easy. Um, you can also hop on YouTube and type in war made easy film and you will find it there. Um, the real news has it up now. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to find it for the next few days. Um, lastly, we are at Roots Action. We are part of the Diffuse Nuclear War Coalition, which includes over 100 groups, like 105 groups now. Uh, the coalition is potentially going to organize something for May Day. We're still figuring things out. It's not locked in, uh, but we're always looking for more organizers, um, people who are a part of groups to join us. Uh, if you are interested in helping us prevent nuclear war, please go to diffusenuclearwar.org and sign up for updates there. We're really looking for people interested in organizing and, and getting people together. So join us if you can. Uh, we've hosted or helped organize over 75 pickets, protests, and demonstrations in the last six months, since October or so. Um, so always looking to grow that coalition. Again, the, the uh, movie at bit.ly slash war made easy and learn more about Diffuse Nuclear War at diffusenuclearwar.org. And as always, you can check out Roots Action at rootsaction.org. And with that, 
thank you all. Thank you, Roxanne, for being here to co-host. Uh, and thank you to our esteemed panelists for this excellent conversation and to Norman for writing a book that turned into a great film. Uh, everybody have a nice night.